Lara El Borno uh, is a Palestinian American international lawyer and co host of the Palestine Pod, as well as being a formidable activist. And we're very glad to have her on the mother of all talk shows. Lara, welcome uh, to the show. I was talking to uh, Ronnie Casserills, uh, South African veteran, uh, earlier, uh, and he was saying how proud everyone in South Africa, well, nearly everyone, was of their uh, legal team and the case that they made. How did it feel to you as a Palestinian watching South Africa making that case? Wow. Well, first of all, I mean, as a Palestinian, I think the the single most important thing is that I felt seen. I think all Palestinians on the day that South Africa presented their oral argument felt seen. Um, merely 10 seconds into the oral argument, they already began with an acknowledgement of the Nakba, which was extremely powerful because as Palestinians for the last 75 years, part of the oppression that we experience is the continued denial of the Nakba, the denial of what happened to us, what happened to our grandparents, and what continues to happen to us today. So for them to begin with that as a way to contextualize this, this ongoing genocide as the a continuation of the Nakba and what happens when you have over 75 years of impunity for human rights violations, that was incredibly powerful. Um, and so honestly, I couldn't be more proud, I couldn't be more touched, um, and I extend my deepest, deepest gratitude to anybody watching here from South Africa, to all the members of the team who pled, and to anyone who stands in solidarity with us worldwide. Amen. And of course, there are more of those now than ever before. Uh, it's a pity so many tens of thousands of people have had to leave their blood on the ground to achieve this level of international solidarity. Uh, as a, a lawyer yourself, what impact do you think the case was making on the distinguished, one hopes, distinguished judges on the bench? Well, if we look at South Africa's case, we can see that they put forward a very convincing case rooted in facts and law. That part is undeniable. Um, in particular, I myself found the portion on genocidal intent extremely convincing because the South African advocate showed very clearly how not only have statements of genocidal intent been made consistently at the highest levels of government for the last three months, but also that those genocidal instructions trickled down to the soldiers on the ground who filmed themselves expressing the same type of sentiment while they blew up entire neighborhoods. Now, that is just damning evidence. Um, so generally, I think really there's no doubt that the South African team proved all the elements uh, of genocide according to the convention. Um, now, on the other hand, the performance of the Israeli advocates was objectively weak. Um, the arguments that they raised on the law, so for example, repeated references to October 7th, we know that there's no legal defense to carrying out genocide. So from a legal perspective, the reason why a state commits a genocide or what they believe they are reacting to can never be a legal defense to genocide. Um, they also repeatedly invoked the notion of self-defense, which I don't think will find favor um, with the court, um, once again, because you can't commit a genocide in self-defense. And in any event, we also know that the International Court of Justice has already decided in 2004 that Israel does not have a right of self-defense in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter with respect to attacks emanating from the occupied Palestinian territory. So really the only way they could have saved themselves is to show that there was no genocidal intent. Because again, the acts themselves are undeniable. But with respect to that, um, the most they could muster was to say that those hundreds of statements of genocidal intent that, that were part of South Africa's analysis are quote unquote random quotes. Now, I don't find that very convincing and I, and I certainly don't expect that the judges will. Um, but that's just the weakness of their case on the law and on the facts it was it was a completely different story i mean a mess of epic proportions because quite simply um they are 
um, presenting a case that's just simply divorced from reality. I mean, you have at one point the Israeli advocate saying that Israel does not bomb hospitals, when I can actually think of a dozen instances where Israel bombed hospitals off the top of my head. Um, they also said they don't target civilians. But, you know, there are words and there are facts, George. And they never once addressed the usage of hundreds of 2,000 pound unguided bombs on Gaza. And this was even confirmed by the US. And so therefore, how can you make an argument that you're not targeting civilians? They never addressed it once. Um, so this really isn't very serious. Well, uh, uh, we have a saying, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And so it was asking their counsel quite a bit to make a, a defense. And they, they sank to the occasion, even getting their pages uh, mixed up in their a presentation. So, I mean, if this were, you know, a tennis match, uh, then then quite clearly the South Africans won uh, very convincingly indeed. But of course, it isn't uh, a tennis match. Uh, and the possibility exists, albeit it's hard to imagine how and how it would be justified. But the possibility exists that the judges will find for Israel and against South Africa, perhaps on some kind of technicality. The one that is being cited is that South Africa had not actually entered a legal dispute with Israel before bringing their case. Can you help us uh, with an explanation of that? Yes, the, it's simply the idea that a dispute from a legal perspective must have arisen before Israel could be brought before the court. Um, and, you know, in, from my perspective, that's also not a deeply serious argument because in South Africa's brief, they pointed to numerous instances where South Africa put Israel on alert that it was considering its actions in Gaza as a case of unfolding genocide and giving Israel an opportunity to respond and to change its behavior. And yet Israel did nothing. It persisted. It continued every day in indiscriminate, uninterrupted bombardment, a starvation and dehydration campaign, um, and preventing Gazans from accessing the most basic supplies like even anesthesia. And, and so um, from my perspective, that's not a serious argument, but we will see how the court will rule. I mean, I'm not um, naive to think that, you know, the implementation or the interpretation of international law, rather, is not divorced from a political context. Um, but I would hope that given the simply damning evidence, the mountains and mountains of, of evidence, the thousands of photos, the thousands of videos that we have by now, the hundreds of statements of genocidal intent, that the court will do the right thing in this instance, um, and that they will find that there is a plausible case. Because let's remember, at the level of provisional measures, the only thing the South African team has to show is that there's at least a plausible case being made of Israel violating the Genocide Convention, and that's a much lower bar than what they will have to show at the merit stage, um, which is that, in fact, Israel has um, uh, carried out violations of the Genocide Convention in a much higher bar. And so, therefore, I, I would find it, I would be very, you know, we'll see what happens, but but I would find it difficult to believe that this case will be dismissed on a technicality of that nature. I agree with that. Uh, let's uh, pursue then for argument's sake uh, that uh, interim relief is granted by the court, that a preliminary finding uh, is that there's a case to answer, which is effectively what it would be, and that whilst that case was examined further, uh, there must be a cessation. Cease and desist uh, is the formulation uh, I use, maybe the court uses. Uh, the, uh, Netanyahu has already said that the court will not stop him, that Israel will not stop whatever the court decides. Now, everything that we know about the Netanyahu cabinet uh, would lead us to conclude he's telling the truth about that. But it would be a much more serious problem, wouldn't it, for the allies of Israel, particularly those that still pretend 
they are democracies, uh, that they are uh, rules-based, that they are uh, uh, law-abiding countries. For them it would be, and you add in the presidential election this year in the United States, it would be very difficult for them to continue business as usual with the state of Israel in the event of such a preliminary or provisional finding, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And I mean, I'll get to that in just a second. But I do just want to add that, you know, this is very on brand for Israel in general. This is not just a question of the Netanyahu government. We're talking about 75 years of impunity. And it also wouldn't be the first time that Israel has blatantly ignored an opinion coming out of the International Court of Justice. Remember that in 2004, the ICJ rendered an advisory opinion on the legality of the wall um, that Israel built on Palestinian land in the occupied West Bank declaring that wall was illegal because it served to steal Palestinian land. The court ordered Israel to dismantle the wall. That was 20 years ago. And of course, Israel never dismantled the wall. And so this is just typical with the entire history of Israel in general. Um, but I also agree with you that um, the situation is going to be very difficult, exceedingly difficult for Israel's allies, its financiers, and providers of weapons, that of course being the US and the UK. And I think it's it's one thing for Israel to openly act in contradiction with an ICJ ruling, but is that really something that the US is prepared to do by continuing to provide Israel with more weapons unconditionally amid such a ruling? Um, you know, if so, the US will also be agreeing to further isolate itself from the world, especially after it already sabotaged two attempts uh, at a ceasefire at the, before the UN Security Council. So is that a path that the US wants to continue on? The US will have to answer that question, but I think that the the ultimate consequence will only be further isolation for the United States and for Israel, further cementing its status as a pariah state. Well, Lara, if I'm ever in trouble in America, I hope you'll be my lawyer. Uh, tell the audience uh, where they can find the Palestine pod, how they can uh, follow your work. Oh, thank you, George. So the Palestine pod is my weekly podcast. Uh, I host with my co-host, Michael Scherzer, Jewish American uh, uh, comedian. Uh, you can find it anywhere where you find podcasts, Spotify, Apple. We're also on YouTube. And you can support my work at Substack, uh, substack.gazengirl.com. Gazengirl, great moniker. Thanks very much for joining us, Lara. And the best of luck to you. We're all hoping, praying, keeping our fingers crossed that this result goes uh, the right way.